Welcome back everyone. Today we learn about nonmetals, air, and atmosphere. The composition of air is made up of 20% oxygen as well as 79% nitrogen. Whereas the composition of dissolved air and water is made up of 33% oxygen, 66% nitrogen, and argon, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and the others listed make up the final last 1%. The properties of oxygen are that it is a colorless, clear, and odorless gas, it is slightly soluble in water, it is neutral to moist litmus paper, it is slightly heavier than air, and lastly is preferred to be collected by displacement of water. There are different ways to collect gases. The first way is the upward delivery of gas, and it involves downward displacement of air, and usually is used for lighter gases like hydrogen and ammonia. The second way is the downward delivery of gas, and it involves the upward displacement of air and is usually used for heavier gases such as hydrogen chloride, sulfur dioxide, chlorine and carbon dioxide. A commonly asked question is why can't hydrogen chloride be collected by the method in the diagram since its molar mass is similar to the MR of oxygen? It is because it is very soluble in water. A chemical test for the presence of oxygen is when a glowing splint would be relight. Oxygen has several uses. The first being oxygen tents in hospitals, where it is used to assist patients with breathing difficulty. It is also used for welding where oxygen burns with acetylene gas at a very high temperature that is used to weld iron or steel. Not only that, it is used for rocket fuel where it enables the combustion of fuel. Lastly, it is used in the aeration of sewage, and it kills harmful bacteria in the treatment plant. If acetylene undergoes complete combustion, the products are carbon dioxide and steam, and it is exhibited in the equation below. If acetylene undergoes incomplete combustion, the products are carbon monoxide and water. In the production of oxygen, Fractional distillation of liquid air can be used as well as hydrogen peroxide, where manganese oxide is used as a catalyst. Another way of preparing oxygen is with the compound KClO3 where it forms oxygen, and the oxidation state of O increases from minus 2 to 0 and this is a redox reaction. The last way to prepare oxygen is to use lead oxide, a red powder, and the oxidation state of lead goes from 4 to 2 and therefore this is a redox reaction as well. The chemical reactions oxygen can undertake is combustion, respiration, and rusting. Combustion is an exothermic reaction, where heat is given off as energy produced as a result of bonds formed is more than the energy taken in as a result of bonds broken. In complete combustion, Oxygen is sufficient or in excess while in incomplete combustion, oxygen is insufficient or limited. In a Bunsen burner, as seen in the diagram below, there has to be a good mix of air and gas for complete combustion. When the air hole is closed, there is incomplete burning as there is more gas than air. There is also a luminous flame, where it is orange. When the air hole is partially opened, there is complete burning as there is a good mix of gas and air. There will be an unluminous flame, where the flame is either pale or dark blue. When the air hole is fully opened, there is too much air and hence burning occurs in the barrel, and there will be a non-luminous flame, where it is blue or green. Now let's look at respiration. It is the process where organism uses oxygen to react with sugar in our body to produce energy and it is seen in the equation below. For photosynthesis, it is the process where plants produce oxygen and sugar as seen in the equation below. Next, let's look at rusting. It is a slow and complex process where iron at normal temperature forms Fe2O3. 
the conditions for rusting to occur is that oxygen must be present, and water must be present as well. The conditions to enhance the rate of rusting is when acidic gases are added, and an example is where carbon dioxide forms an acid when dissolved in water, or carbonic acid as well. This diagram shows what conditions would result in the quickest rusting or no rusting and keep in mind that equal amount of oxygen and water is required for enhanced rate of rusting. In order to prevent rusting, we need to cut off oxygen and water present, or coating iron with oil or grease, painting over it, coating it with non-corrosive metal, like tin. Another way is the sacrificial protection of iron where we put a highly reactive metal with iron and the reactive metal oxidizes rather than iron when exposed to oxygen and water. An example of an air pollutant is carbon monoxide, which is poisonous. Hemoglobin is the red pigment in blood that carries oxygen and when combined with oxygen, forms oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin bonds irreversibly with carbon monoxide to form stable carboxyhemoglobin which destroys hemoglobin's oxygen carrying capacity. In order to prevent the air pollution of carbon monoxide, we need to ensure there is sufficient air prior to burning and also we could use a catalytic converter. Another example of an air pollutant is sulfur dioxide. It is formed during the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural where there are traces of sulfur present. It can also be formed from volcanic activities. It is colorless and strong smelling, as well as being poisonous, irritating the eyes and causing breathing difficulty. It also leads to acid rain as seen in the equation below, forming acidic soil and corrosion. As mentioned, the acid rain that is formed, can corrode building surfaces, metal, cement, or limestone structures like bridges. Due to land being acidic, it will be unsuitable for crops, and since water is now acidic, it will kill fish. In order to prevent air pollution by sulfur dioxide, desulfurization can occur, where we can remove sulfur dioxide from waste gas, utilize sulfur-free fuels, and also treat exhaust gases from power stations with limestone, The last example of an air pollutant is nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. It is formed from the reaction between stable nitrogen and oxygen at high temperature during lightning, or from motor car engines, industries, or power stations. The color of NO is colorless while the color of NO2 is brown and it damages lungs and causes eye irritation. Catalytic converter is attached in all motor vehicles to reduce pollution and it operates at a high temperature. For the first generation of catalyst, due to lead in activating catalysts, in 1975, we saw the widespread introduction of unleaded gasoline. This resulted in dramatic reductions in ambient lead levels and alleviated many serious environmental and human health concerns associated with lead pollution. For the second generation catalysts, they included a three way catalyst which converts carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide and water, and also helps reduce nitrogen oxides to nitrogen and oxygen. Overall, helping to optimize the efficiency of the catalytic converter. Catalytic converters have honeycomb coated with fine powder of platinum and rhodium, and it involves oxidation where carbon monoxide is oxidized to carbon dioxide. It also involves reduction of NO or NO2 to nitrogen as seen in the equation below, and lastly it involves oxidation of unburnt hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide and water in the equation below. A question that is asked is why do exhaust pipes rust at a faster rate than other parts of the car? It is because carbon dioxide which is an acidic oxide together with water vapor are produced and they enhance the rate of rusting. A question often asked is why should air be piped into the catalytic converter? It is because there is insufficient oxygen or oxides of nitrogen to oxidize the carbon monoxide and unburnt hydrocarbon. Therefore, the oxygen in air introduced would oxidize the carbon monoxide and unburnt hydrocarbon. Ozone helps shield us from UV radiation, as this radiation causes skin cancer, genetic mutation as well as eye damage. It also damages marine life. 
Chlorofluorocarbon is a compound that contains carbon, chlorine, and fluorine. It is designed to be inert and unreactive, and it is very stable, seen in how CFCs have a lifetime of 20 to 100 years. CFC are used in coolants and propellants since it is highly unreactive and does not react with the chemicals that is being propelled. An example of coolants where CFCs are used is in air conditioning and refrigerators. Man-made CFC at stratosphere destroys ozone, and one CFC molecule does a lot of damage since they can exist for a long time. When UV light hits the chlorofluorocarbon, it undertakes the reactions as follows, in the process, destroying ozone, while producing chlorine which returns to destroy even more ozone molecules. Let's talk about the greenhouse effect. It involves the trapping of the Earth's infrared radiation which causes rise in temperature of Earth, it decreases in crop yield as more vegetated lands become deserts. It is also raises in sea level causing flooding of low-lying lands as a result of the melting of ice at the poles. It also leads to rapid evaporation of water from Earth causing liberation of dissolved carbon dioxide which enhances greenhouse effect. Examples of greenhouse gases are firstly carbon dioxide, which is released to the atmosphere when solid waste, fossil fuels, and wood are burned. Next, is also methane, which is emitted during the production and transport of coal, natural gas, and oil. It results from the decomposition of organic wastes in waste landfills and raising of livestock as well. Lastly, nitrous oxide, which is emitted during agricultural and industrial activities as well as during combustion of solid waste and fossil fuels. Finally, let's look at the carbon cycle, where it has three main processes, respiration, combustion, and photosynthesis, which can also be seen in the diagram. That's all for today. Thank you for the effort to learn with me. Stay tuned for more interesting lessons. See you next time. Bye-bye.